Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Business Brew. I am your host, Bill Brewster. Uh, super, super happy to be reunited with William Green. Uh, the the catalyst for the conversation is his new book, Richer, Wiser, and Happier. I've read it. It's fantastic. Um, but selfishly, I have been looking for a reason to talk to William because he and I met at uh, Berkshire after the Markel lunch. And I asked him if he would be willing to grab lunch with me. Two and a half hours later, I almost missed my flight. It was one of the more enjoyable conversations I've ever had. Um, And one of the great reasons and, um, you know, just one of those spontaneous connections that comes out of Berkshire that uh, I've always remembered. And I'm, I'm really happy to be able to reciprocate some sort of favor and having him on the podcast. And I, I can't recommend the book enough. I think it was a great read. So, Thank William, you so how you much, doing? Bill. I'm, I'm great, and I'm really happy to be here with you. I have very fond memories of our, of our lunch. And in, in a way, it's a perfect example of what I write about in the book about the compounding of goodwill, where, um, where Guy, this is a concept that Guy Spear, my friend, who, who I helped write his autobiography, talked to me about, where, you know, if you just go through life not uh, just, just kind of trying to be relatively decent despite all of our flaws, um, it kind of works out better. And, and so we had this lunch where neither of us had any agenda. We were just there like, kind of really happily chatting, giving each other life advice, talking about investors and just having a good time. And then here we are years later. And, you know, you're a big shot podcast host with this great <laughs> podcast. And and um, you, you feel goodwill towards me and I feel goodwill towards you. And it's it's kind of it, it's it's a really beautiful example, actually, of how things work when you just surround yourself with decent people and you try to treat them decently it it just works and it's a it's a kind of miraculous thing to discover and it, 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 it I'm, I'm serious about this i mean i I'm, I'm not just trying to be charming to you i mean it actually it is a miraculous thing you start to feel like you're you're surrounded by really lovely people who are very high quality and who are all looking out for each other and it makes life a hell of a lot easier and i, I think we were brought up thinking that we should all have hard you know we should we should have sharp elbows because life is tough and it's Darwinian and and maybe that's true I I don't know but I I am um, I think this is a better model and uh, and and I think Tom Gaynor actually embodies it so it's kind of nice that we met at the Markel lunch because I think may, maybe that's part of it is that he he surrounds himself at Markel with people who were who were pretty decent because because he embodies that himself. Yeah, Tom is uh he's a cool guy. I I know uh Sarab or Sarab. I'm sorry if I said Yeah, said Sarab wrong. Madan, and, who's yeah. wonderful as well. He's really a great, lovely guy. Great human. Yeah. Um he had he had me to Markel once and I got to spend some time with Tom and and who Tom is behind closed doors is exactly who he is in front of people, which is a nice thing to be able to say about somebody. Um, there was a wonderful thing while I was reporting this book where I went and spent a couple of days with Tom. Um who uh, people who, who don't know Tom is the co-CEO of Markel. And so here's a guy who's running a company that's what, in the top 350 or so in the Fortune 500. And I go hang out, we probably spent a day and a half in, in his office. There are no phone calls. It's just completely quiet, completely peaceful. And then I, I wanted to see him in his natural habitat. So I, I asked if I could come home for dinner with him, um, which is a somewhat impertinent thing to do. You wouldn't ask many CEOs of Fortune 500 companies, if you could do that. And we drive out at the end of this long day where I've been grilling him all day. And he goes to the supermarket in his um, in his little um, Prius, you know, his, his, his sort of tiny, not very grand um, hybrid car and walks around the supermarket shopping for salmon and stuff. And then we go home and we keep chatting while he's while he's making the salmon himself and then his his wife comes who runs one of the businesses at Markel and before the dinner they actually they reach over and hold your hands to say grace and then you sit and sit and chat and they're super candid um incredibly welcoming um and I just was thinking how how many CEOs of Fortune 500 companies would go shopping like that, would cook you a meal like that. There's something really understated about him. And I, you know, I think he's a very, very smart, incredibly driven and successful guy and a terrific investor. But I think, I think what really stands out is, is his quality as a human being. And I think that that infuses everything that he does really. Yeah. I, uh, 
I hope he will come on at some point. Um, I, uh, I, I'd love to talk to him a little bit about what would be different if he were running a book of fixed, like a fixed portfolio as opposed to investing insurance float. And, um, I, I'm certain he's got thoughtful answers, but I, I couldn't agree more with you that every interaction that I have had with him and I'm not presenting myself to be close to him or anything like that, but He's just a gem of a man. So uh. He did this lovely thing a, a couple of months ago where I posted something on Facebook of my kids who are 19 and 22 playing playing a song together. It was a John Prine song, really beautiful, very soulful song. And it was it was during Hanukkah, right? So I'm Jewish and we had a, a menorah, these candlelights. And it's kind of beautiful. And they, they would sit at the table and just play guitar and sing together. And they're singing this kind of soulful song. And you can see they have, um, thank God, a lovely relationship, the two kids, and they sing kind of beautifully. And, um, and, and, and then a few days later, I get a call from Tom saying, I just wanted to tell you how touched I was by that video. I really loved it. And then the next thing I know, I'm getting an email from Sorab, who's his right hand man, saying, oh, Tom, I'm not on Facebook, but Tom showed me the video. And it's and the, again, there's something just really, really nice about that and, and really thoughtful. And I, Tom, Tom said something really interesting to me while I was interviewing him that he said, he said, because I'm a nice guy, I'm just surrounded by people who want to help me. And he, he kind of repeated it and he said, and they just help. And there was something really interesting because I don't think he was being self-flattering by saying, oh, I'm such a nice guy. I think he was just being candid because he's a candid person. And I, I think there's a, there's a deep secret there. And I, I, I coined this phrase that I, I was overly proud of, which was the mensch effect, that I think if you're a mensch, if you're just a decent human being, there is a certain advantage. And, and so, so Tom is highly capable. He's a, he's a very capable investor. But I think one of the reasons why he's surrounded by people who want to help him is that he's decent. And if you think about it, he got, for example, to be on the Washington Post board with with Buffett for years. So he's there surrounded with these extraordinary people who he's learning from. And Josh Tarasoff, a friend of mine who's a very, very smart hedge fund manager, helped Tom at one point to understand Amazon. I think at the Markel meeting that you, were not, you and I were at, Tom announced, he said, I'm my friend Josh Tarasoff, who's here, explained to me why I needed to own Amazon. And then similarly, there's another great investor that I write about, Chuck Acre, who who's made something like 100 times his money on Markel stock over the years. And, and Chuck Acre had a really huge impact on, on Tom by explaining really the overwhelming importance of investing in companies with a, with a, a high return on investment that have this, this ability to keep investing, to keep reinvesting at high rates of return. And I think this is something that Tom naturally understood anyway. It's been one of the four principles that, that's guided him through all of these years. But at the same time, I think what he said is that, is that Chuck Acre intensified his belief that that's the most important of the four principles. And so he said, if you look at something like Berkshire Hathaway, you just see that Berkshire originally was this crappy textile mill company, but the advantage that you had was that a, there was a genius allocating your capital. And that because he was able to keep doing it at high rates of return over many, many years, uh, you ended up going from, you know, whatever it was, $15 a share or $30 a share or whatever to 300 and something thousand. And so I think it's really interesting that Tom describes himself as a, as a node in a neural network. And so there are all of these people in his network who are helping him. And it's a very, it's a very interesting thing because then there are all of these great investors that I write about who actually have very low EQ. And uh, their advantage is that they're kind of machines. They're really great thinkers um, and calculators of odds and probabilities. And then you have this other, this other model um, of people who actually have, have high EQ and that's an advantage. And so I, th I think if there's a takeaway from this long and rambling monologue of mine, it's that it's that you have to know yourself and you have to be aware of of whether you're wired um, in a way that the EQ is an advantage or whether you're wired in a way where where your lack of emotion and your ability to calculate odds and be super rational and dispassionate is an advantage. And there's not 
there's not a better or worse. It's just it's just you better be self-aware so that you're playing a game that you're equipped to win. So first of all, uh, we're not going to have this conversation without telling people about your your time at Time Magazine and, huh. and your early career. But I'm going to follow, and people, you have to stick around for that because it's awesome. But, um, you know, I can't think of a better time to have this particular conversation because I have really been struggling with this exact issue uh, that you describe. And what's going on in my life is, you know, I'm a guy who is trying to manage my own money. Like Mm. fundamentally, that's what I'm trying to do. I don't have any interest in managing outside capital. I've happened to network my way into a bunch of emerging managers. I found myself in some rooms of some people that I really respect in large part because of Berkshire and because of the network that I've Mm. met there. Um, and now I've got this podcast and, you know, I owe a lot to Toby Carlisle for putting me on his podcast uh, to sort of start some of the flywheel going for lack of, I hate that I said flywheel, but I did. I said that uh, last week as well. And as I said it, <laughs> I said it on some, some podcast and then suddenly realized, I have no idea if I really Sounds know what so that douchey. means. I think, I think, you know, I have vague memories of reading those Clayton Christensen kind of books. And then I'm like, nah, I probably misquoted that. Or, or uh, so, so yeah, I'm, I'm glad that you're uncomfortable with it too. Yeah. It's, it's just so overused, I think. But, um, but anyway, what I'm worried about now is, you know, I find myself getting inbounds from like, I mean, people that I just have so much respect for that want to help me. Um, but on the other hand, like I, I am intrigued by advanced investing concepts, right? I do play special situations and in this business, um, you know, people, I talk about some advanced concepts and I worry that, um, people that are not as advanced listen to some of what they hear on this and then follow me in. And I am dealing like it is really, really hard for me right now to deal with feeling the pressure. And I think the reason that I feel that is I am high EQ and have a lot of empathy. And I I actually just got a therapist. I'm going mm. Thursday for the first time because I really need to figure out how to harden my skin um, because it's, it's like uh, it almost was like a disease that infested my mind two weeks ago that like I, I almost got paralyzed by it a little bit. Um, why, why do you want to harden your skin? Um, I think I need to either figure out whether or not um, I need to change the way that I'm operating or whether or not I need to be more like buyer beware and just tell people like do your own work. And a lot of people that I've respected have said, look, man, the way that that you approach things, I th- they ha- they don't perceive me to be on the side of. They, if anything, I've heard that I err too far on caveating what I say. So I think I just need to be more okay with putting information out there and telling people to do their own work. That part of me needs to get a little bit harder. Yeah, it's a, it's a complicated question. I have so many thoughts on it that are, that are sort of com- competing to come out first. Um, one, one of the things that I, I, I've spent a lot of time thinking about things that Josh Waitskin has said, who wrote this wonderful book, The Art of Learning, and then has done a few amazing podcast interviews with Tim Ferriss and then kind of disappears into his cave and doesn't really talk to anyone. And, and what Waitskin, who I think is a truly brilliant person, really interesting, he has this wonderful phrase, I don't think was in his book, but has, was in one of his podcasts where he talks about unobstructed self-expression. And that's what you're trying to get to is unobstructed self-expression. And I talk about this in a different sense in my book about being in alignment with who you are in a deep way. And I think when you see someone like Monish Pabrai, who I write about a lot in the first chapter, he's someone who's deeply in alignment with who he is. And that that was one of the great lessons that he got from from Warren Buffett and that Guy Spear um, also got from, from having their $650,000 charity lunch with Buffett is that that Buffett truly lives by this inner scorecard. He's he's aligned with his own weirdness and idiosyncrasy, and and doesn't doesn't do things that aren't right for him. And and when I had this this flight back from Irvine, California, one time when I'd been interviewing Monish there, I I wrote down these lessons from from Monish on the way back, and it literally there was a piece of paper. I was very excited by being with Monish because he has such an extraordinary mind, and I. Uh, there's something very energizing about it. And you have this sense of revelation. I didn't want to miss this moment. And so I scroll down lessons from Monish and there, and I write down in the first chapter what they are. And 
And one of them is literally don't do what's not right for you. And I think this sounds like a, a, a kind of digressive way to respond to what you're saying. But I think I think part of the secret in in the way that you do your podcast or in the way that you invest or in the way that I write or the way that I talk to you, it's just to be deeply true to who you are and to your strengths and your priorities. And if you're inclined to caveat a lot and to be candid and to have EQ and, uh, and to have a, a, a soft exterior rather than a hard skin, that's, those, are, those are superpowers. And, and I would say you want to be more and more deeply aligned with who you are while also working on the things that are flaws. So, so you're kind of in two places simultaneously. It's, it's being happy with who you are and accentuating those positive characteristics. But at the same time, being aware, well, I need to work on this because I'm, I, I do this too much or I, you, you know, look, I talk too much. So, so I, have to, I have to listen more or, or uh, you know, I keep thinking like here I am doing a, doing a book promotion tour. And I keep really consciously thinking, how do I how do I stop myself becoming full of pride? And start start to think that I'm actually like a big deal or really smart or anything, you know. So so it's so you're consciously trying to think about where you could be screwing up, um, but also at the same time really trying to be true to yourself and play your the hand that you've been dealt in terms of your situation with managing money, in terms of your situation with your podcast and having this tremendous um, uh, uh, you know pulpit. Um, an ability to have conversations and share wisdom and spread ideas and and your you know your characteristics and your temperament play to those strengths rather than trying to play someone else's hand and so i don't think i think going to a shrink is great and you know self-awareness is really fantastic um but i don't think it's so much to try to change i don't know i don't have full confidence in what i just said it's not because obviously we all want to change well, um, I've got some other stuff I need to sort of uh, deal with in the at the moment, yeah. and I guess that that some of what you said there of like when you're doing the book tour, how do you prevent yourself from feeling like you know you're? Uh, I'm just gonna say the shit because that's huh. that's what I have struggled with feeling yeah. at, at times, right? And like, um, th- there is, I- I'm in a weird place right now where. I had for me a good year last year. Um, I I had some pretty contrarian calls uh, that worked out, and now I'm doing this podcast, and people seem to like it. And like, there's a big part of me that that just constantly needs to be like, you are nothing in the world, right? Like the the world could go on without you. Don't start thinking that you're bigger than you are. Um, but there, there's also the part of me that acknowledges that, like, through a podcast platform, uh, there is distribution is ubiquitous, right? So it's hard to know who's listening, and I do feel some responsibility to sort of like protect people. But then again, I you can't really protect people from themselves, you know. But yeah, it's, it's but something you're still that I'm struggling responsible. with. You're responsible for them, and I think you. I mean, didn't you had that story with your cousin, right? Or your yeah. wife's cousin who yeah. was hurt by people who were unscrupulous and... Uh, yeah, well, I mean, he, yeah, he committed suicide. It was... Yeah, I, I'm so sorry. And so I actually think that's a deep part of who you are is wanting to protect people from exploitation and deceit and themselves and, and you know, the darker side of, of the investment business. And so I actually think... I. I think you're being deeply true to yourself in in wanting to caveat and wanting to protect people, and I think in a, in a sense you're you're honoring your relative by doing that. And so I, I would go big on that. I would, I think that's a that's a big part of your of your mission, actually, whether consciously or not, is to spread information that's not self serving and that helps others and that's not deceptive because there's so much deception and self-serving information in the investment business. And so if you can be a force for spreading real information, uh, uh, you know, yeah, you'll be wrong at times, but at least people will sense if you're trying to be truthful. And I, I think that's a very powerful thing to do. The other thing I would say, just if I could go back to a thing that you said a minute ago that I think is really, really important, where you said um, you have to remind yourself that you're nothing. Um, 
there's a really wonderful insight from a, a, a great sage, a Kabbalist called Rav Bunim, I think was his name, of Peshishacha. And it came up when um, I was interviewing a great hedge fund manager called Paul Isaac, who I actually don't write about in the book, but who's an utterly brilliant guy with a wonderful mind. And he quoted this line to me, and it's a line that's always had a big impact on me. And what Rav Bunim, Rav means teacher, what he said is that you should have one piece of paper in one pocket that says, I am ashes and dust. So, you know, I'm nothing. And in the other pocket, you should have a piece of paper that says the whole world was created just for me. And he said, ah. depending on your mood and which of those things you need, you take out one piece of paper or the other. And one of the great truths in life is that both of these things are true. We are absolutely nothing. We're like these tiny, tiny cogs in this much bigger thing. And, you know, you know we're like little ants. And at the same time, we have such a profound importance and we have such an enormous impact on other people's lives. And you can see that you can you can save a person's life. And I, I quote this in the chapter that I write about about Monish, where um, when I think about all of the stuff that he's done with Dakshana, with his charitable foundation, that's really yanked thousands and thousands of families out of poverty, where he's he's basically he's basically taken this strange ability that he has to play this game where he sits quietly in a room and occasionally finds a mispriced stock. He's used this strange ability to change thousands of lives. And and I say that in, in sentimental moments, I I see, for example, Ashok Talapatra, who's a, a guy I write about in that chapter, who now who who managed helped Yank out of poverty, who's this brilliantly clever guy who's now a rising star at Google and was part of the Dakshana program. And I say, um, when I see something like that with Monish and Guy and Ashok at Berkshire Hathaway together, and I see how Ashok's life has been changed. I'm, I'm reminded of that, that line about if you save one life, you save the world. And then I, and then I talked to Monish about it and he's like, yeah, life's meaningless. And I'm just trying not to screw people up and just to help people and do a good job with my kids and everything else is just a game. And I, I don't know that he's totally sincere about that. I, I think, I think Monish, you know, there's a surface of Monish that's really funny and brutally frank. And then I think there's a softer side of him that's really kind and caring and generous and really wants to make a huge difference in people's lives. Um, maybe it's a little bit like Charlie Munger, who has this tough exterior, but I think underneath it is a, is a very, very special, very lovely guy. But so I think, I think that idea that we're simultaneously nothing, uh, that we're ashes and dust, which is actually a line that, that Monish quotes sometimes. Um, he'll say, I am just ashes and dust, or, you know, I think that's, it's a it's a good reminder not to get too full of ourselves, but at the same time not to get too down on ourselves because if you if you start to think that you're nothing, then you don't take advantage of the incredible gifts that you've been given. And I and and so I think there's a there's a trajectory in our lives where I mean this is something that the Kabbalists who had a great influence on my thinking what they say is that you you start with what they call the desire for the self alone, which is really just your ego. It's like just wanting to look out for yourself, wanting to make money for yourself, have a bigger car, get respect, get adulation, um, you know, have beautiful women or men interested in you and uh, all, all sorts of outer scorecard stuff to put it in, in Buffett's terminology. And then gradually over the course of your lifetime, you're supposed to transform that that desire to receive for the self alone into what this great Kabbalist Rav Ashlag called the desire to receive for the sake of sharing. And so you still want to have the success of a good book or of a great podcast or of, uh, you know, a great marriage or a beautiful home, but you're not controlled by the sort of outer aspect of it. So you're not, you're, you're not so in love with the money or the fame or the reputation or the external validation that it controls you. And I think, I think that's, a, that's a tremendous challenge and it's not a one-time thing, it's a constant battle. And so I'll still find myself constantly looking to see, well, did people like this? And do they, do they, did they review this well? And, um, and, I, I, and then I have to 
I have to try to have a sense of humor about that, try not to suppress those negative emotions, but to look at them with honesty. And there's a, there's a, there's a, a wonderful guy I've been studying recently, this um, Tibetan Buddhist, a guy called Sokni Rinpoche. It's extraordinary and very similar to the Kabbalists in many ways. And he has, he has this beautiful expression where he, he talks about those negative characteristics, whether it's your vanity or your pride or your ego or your anger or your self-loathing, whatever it might be. He describes them as beautiful monsters. And in his meditation practice, part of what you're doing is just being very aware of those beautiful monsters without actually trying to change them or judge them or dislike them or suppress them or repress them or project onto other people um, by blaming them for your uh, idiosyncrasies or flaws or screw ups. And instead, you just abide with them. And, and he has this beautiful expression where he says, one day we will, we will be friends with all of our beautiful monsters. And it's I've, I've really been pondering this a lot recently, because on the one hand, there's the sort of um, there's the kind of Tony Robbins approach where you're you you see a negative emotion and then you kind of replace it in a sense. I'm probably mis mis explaining it, but in a sense, you're replacing it with these positive emotions like like appreciation and love and gratitude. And I think that's a, it's a very, very powerful technique. And he describes it in, in the last chapter of Unshakable. Um, a, a book of his. But I think this other technique is also a very interesting one to, to accept that we have these flaws, these negative emotions, these negative patterns, and to be aware of them and be with them in a loving, accepting, slightly humorous way, and to snuggle up to our, our beautiful monsters. And, and, and one of the practices that Sogni Rinpoche talks about, Rinpoche means, means precious one, I think, in Tibetan. He, um, He's a, uh, he, he, he has this handshake practice. And so when these things arise, these negative emotions or thoughts, you handshake them. And so instead of repressing them or saying, oh, I can't believe I'm full of pride, or I can't believe I'm, I'm so hurt that, you know, I sent, I sent out an email uh, uh, that I was telling you about before a mass email announcing my, my book, which is a very uncomfortable thing for me to do in multiple ways, partly because I'm technologically incompetent. And someone I actually really admire wrote back, and he's someone I actually like and know personally, although I think he's forgotten. He wrote back and all it says is remove. And so all of these <laughs> lovely emails that I got back from other people um, have been trumped by this one guy who's a great oh, writer funny. and a lovely person and a really close friend of a really close friend of mine. They've all been trumped by this guy saying remove. And so I have to see my reaction to that and in a way handshake it and be like, yeah, yeah, okay, that's that, yeah. that's. That's upsetting, but he's a really good guy. And then I have to think, and actually, I'm really irritated by people marketing to me the whole time. Hmm. And so what am I supposed to learn? Like, should I be, you know, a, li a little bit more aware of my own uh, irritation and intolerance of other people? And, and so it's just once you become aware of your negative patterns or your negative is not even a very helpful word because it's too judgmental. But once you become aware of your beautiful monsters, you can be with them and respond to them more intelligently instead of trying to suppress them or instead of me turning to this guy and being like, that bastard, I can't believe he did this, which, which I think I would have been more inclined to do before. And so in a way, th th this stuff sounds like a big digression in some ways, but, but if, you, if you react in these negative, very reactive ways, it messes you up in your relationships, in your, in your investing, in your writing. I mean, if, if, if you overreact as an investor, it's very hard to be rational. And so I, I, f I feel like when we were growing up, no one really taught us how to deal with our emotions. And part of parenting ourselves is figuring out, well, so what, what do I do when I feel myself become, becoming arrogant and proud, or I feel myself be having this sense of total worthlessness and despair, um, or, or, or just feeling angry and and betrayed or or jealous or and no no one taught us how to deal with this stuff particularly for me growing up in England I mean that's not exactly something that the, the, the wayward emotions are not uh, things that the English are particularly good at dealing with we we repress them deep down and never talk about them um, and so I think I think this idea of how you how you deal with your sense of worthlessness with your sense of vanity with your greed 
dealing with them intelligently, handshaking them, being aware of them, and and having a kind of loving loving awareness of them rather than a rather than a uh, I can't believe I'm like that still after all these years of working on myself. I can't believe what a schmuck I am. And it, it, that, you you get in these um in these spirals uh, that I don't think are very helpful. No, I think that's fair. Um, and I guess like one of, so one of the things that I I highlighted a person who um, manages some micro cap companies. Yeah, and I also owned the shares of those companies when I did it. And I had a couple people that I knew uh, that I respect reach out to me and say that they didn't think that that was you know a particularly great look. Um, and then on top of that, like a deal got announced shortly after I had highlighted the person. And I, I have been struggling with whether or not um, I made the right decision to own the shares when the episode ran. And like I, I've just kind of going back like far enough, you know, I, I had first bought the shares in January and then I thought that I was going to interview him in February and then I sold the shares and then filing started to roll out so then I bought the shares and I dropped the ball scheduling an interview and then we scheduled an interview and it's like um I guess what I have tried to figure out over the past couple weeks is like whether or not um I have sacrificed something that I should not have sacrificed in integrity because greed wanted me to to win right like and how much of that is did I violate something that should be core to who I am or, uh, you know, did I do something that my inner scorecard is okay with? And I, as I've thought about it, I guess that where I've sort of landed is I never promised anybody that I'm a journalist, right? Like this podcast is biased. It's people I want to talk to. It's people that I'm disposed to like. On the other hand, uh, I do understand that maybe as my influence grows over time, I should adjust how I'm operating. And I think that like, I need to deal with some of, uh, like real things in my life from my past that I need to deal with in order to actually like make the right decision going forward. And I, I just don't know what the answer is. I'm pretty sure that I know what it is, but I just kind of need to work through, some of, I mean, you refer to the monsters. I mean, I've got stuff that like, it, I don't know. It, it brought up weird shit from my childhood yeah. for real yeah. that like I need to work through. And that's really why I'm doing it, right? I'm not like doing it uh, like, like why I'm going to talk to somebody. It, it, I'm not doing it because I'm, I, I think it's coming from a place of power and not a place of weakness, but um, it, it's yeah, just you're self-reflective and I, I think that's yeah. probably why we ended up spending several hours together when we first met is because you're someone who's trying to grope towards some sort of truth who's trying to figure out how to live who's trying to figure out how to be a decent person trying to figure out how to um how to fulfill your talent um and play the cards you've been dealt in the best way and 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 so i think you sense when you're out of alignment and you're trying to get aligned. And I think that um, that sense of um, discomfort and misalignment, which I feel often, is a very powerful thing. And it, it propels you forward. There's a beautiful line from William Blake, great poet, that I think about constantly and quote often, where he says, without contraries is no progression. And so you need you need the darkness to force you to to look for the light. You need you need setbacks. You and and that sense that sense that progression comes from these things that are in conflict. I think is very powerful, and it it helps you during the times when you're in conflict, when you feel this isn't working. Um, I would say one of the things that's been really helpful to me that's been clarified in the process of interviewing lots of great investors and thinking about what they figured out and, and what their lives mean is I think it's really helpful to have a few very, very simple filters that give you a kind of true north that you can come back to a lot. And, and one of the best filters is from Nick Sleep and, and, and Zach um, K. Sakaria, who calls himself Zach, 
um, who I write about in this chapter um, called Nick, Nick and Zach's um, Excellent Adventure, which is one of my favorite chapters in the book. Yeah, because, that was an awesome chapter. Thanks. They're just and really remarkable. And not many remarkable. people have access to those guys. So yeah, they never spoke. Hats off to you. Thanks. But it's but they're really special guys. They're really wonderful people. And um, um, again, like Tom Gaynor, very, very good role models for life, uh, extraordinary role models. And one of the things that they did is they, um, Nick, when he was very young, when he was maybe 18, 19, became obsessed with Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance, this book by Robert Pusick, which is a very strange and brilliant meditation on, on values and quality. And it was rejected by something like 130 publishers. And you can see why, because it's a really strange memoir um, and tutorial about how to live. Uh, and I think it's subtitled An Inquiry into Values. And one of the things that Persig writes about, which he capitalizes, is quality. This idea, this very nebulous notion of quality, where he says whether you're, whether you're fixing a, a dress or, or mending a chair or, or sharpening a knife or working on mo motorcycle maintenance, there's a high quality way to do it. A, a beautiful way to do it and a low quality, ugly way to do it. And that concept of quality, which sounds very vague, was tremendously helpful for Nick and Zach because they could say, for example, okay, let's think about our fee structure. What's the quality solution? Well, the quality solution is to set, up, set it up in a way that doesn't really serve us, but serves our shareholders. And so they kept making their own fee, fee structure progressively worse for themselves. So they got to a point where they actually, they, they put their, their incentive fee in a kind of holding pen so that if they then screwed up, they'd have to pay all of their fees that they'd earned back to the shareholders. And so during the financial crisis, I don't actually write about this, but during the financial crisis, they... It, they, they at one point owed years and years of fees. So they, they had gone way behind the starting line and would have to pay back all of those fees. And they actually liked that. And so there was wow, some... Wow, that's crazy in the middle of the financial crisis to like that. That's well, wild. Well, they liked the fact that they weren't screwing their shareholders. Uh, yeah. Like Zach said, I, I quite like the feeling of wearing a hair shirt and being kind of righteous and not, and he liked the intellectual experiment of setting up the fund so that it was this almost spiritual exploration of how do you live life in the most high quality way? How do you manage money in the most high quality way? How do you, how do you treat your partner in the most high quality way? And here they are years after they wrapped up the fund and sent back $3 billion to their shareholders and they still share an office. Uh, they don't go there that often, but they sh they're they really close to each other. And what Nick said to me is, good behavior has a longer shelf life. And so the longevity of their relationship, of their partnership, of the success of their fund is built on this obsession with quality. And so to get back to what we were saying in the first place, when you were talking about how, how, how do I know whether, whether I should disclose this about my investment here or whether I whether I sh should be acting as a journalist or whether I should and, and be clear about my conflicts of interest. I think it's a really helpful filter to say, what's the quality move here? And then you just pause and you say, well, okay, so this serves me really well. Um, and so I'm going to be tempted to do it, but it may not look good or maybe I maybe I walk away from this. And I, I'm not saying that's what you should have done, yeah, but I have yeah. this conflict in many situations where I have to say, um, w what's really helpful to me is when I, when I say, um, I need to be willing to let go of this. And so if it doesn't go my way, I need to be willing to let go and walk away. And even if it's some, and, and so in a way it gets back to that Buddhist notion. There's a, there's a beautiful line that I, I think I quote in my book, um, from from the Buddha, where he says to abide independent, clinging to nothing at all. And I, I think the thing that gets us in trouble is the clinging. It's the sense of, um, I must make this money. I must get this book on the bestseller list. I must have a bigger podcast, bigger guests, bigger. And the, the ability to abide independent and say, yeah, yeah, that would be really nice. 
but I don't need it. I can walk away is is really powerful. And it's and it's difficult because there's this great line from Ben Franklin that Charlie Munger quotes often and Buffett quotes often where um, Franklin said an empty sack can't stand straight. And so when you feel empty, when you're having a difficult time or when you're financially challenged and something that's really lucrative comes along, it's very hard to have this sense of beneficence and this sense of, yeah, 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 let me give to this charity and yeah, 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 let me walk away from this deal. And so you're inclined to cling to it. And so I think just being self-aware and knowing when we might be getting sucked into something because we have a desperate desire for approval or for success or we're afraid of money, those, those, are, those are the beautiful monsters that we need to befriend and not repress because otherwise, it's, you know, for investing, the markets are very brutal and they tend to expose these fault lines in our character. And so if, you, if you're greedy or you're reckless, for example, um, or you're, um, I mean, any character flaw, really, it comes up and bites you. And so when I, when I look back to probably the single biggest mistake that I made as an investor, it was investing in a private company that was run by a friend of mine in Hong Kong. And she was someone I really like. I mean, and she was married to a friend of mine that I'm close to. And Goldman Sachs had invested a, a, a tiny, a, a tiny valuation. I, 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 sorry, I'd invested a tiny valuation compared to what Goldman Sachs had invested uh, at privately. So here I was thinking, well, I'm, I'm getting in at the bottom. I know these people and you know i'm i'm an insider and so it made me feel smart it made me feel part of the inside set that i had privileged access then when things started to get wrong i had to go wrong i stood by my friend in a kind of very public way which made me feel like i was i was protecting the damsel in distress who was someone who who was a very close friend of ours um, who was having a terrible time so there were there were all of these ways in which my own idiosyncratic um, personality traits messed me up. And if I had just been, I, I remember mentioning it to Guy Spear at one point and saying, you, you know, you should really look at this company. It's extraordinary technology. And he just looked at it and he was like, no, nah, I don't do that sort of thing. And he just had a simple filter of like, no, I, that's, that's just not somewhere where I have a competitive advantage. And he just, and, and, and I lost lots of money doing that all because of these flaws in my personality. And so I, I think just being self-aware and having a sense of, of where your beautiful monsters are likely to mess you up, whether in markets or relationships. And I, I think usually what happens that's really helpful is if, if there's a pattern of things that recur in your life where, say, you have the same sort of difficult relationship with difficult bosses, or you have repeated situations where you lose money, you make lots of money, and then you keep losing it and going back to zero, or... Um, you have the same failed relationships. I mean, I have a friend who once said to me, I've been married to the same woman three times. They just all had different names. So it's these things where you repeat the pattern. That's usually a pretty good clue that that's something you really need to work on because otherwise it's just going to come back and bite you again. Yeah, that's interesting. I, I like that. Um, you know, my my particular situation, I don't think is a pattern issue, but uh, I, I just need to work through it a little bit. We'll see. Um, I, but it gets back to this issue of you wanting to be someone who's honest and honorable and yeah, perceived that's right. to be like, doing I, a good thing and looking I'm out for people. I'm worried that I had clouded judgment from motivated reasoning. That That's the yeah. only thing that I'm actually worried about. And I'm not even sure that I'm worried about... Uh, well, actually, I do know. I'm not really that worried about what other people think. I am worried about whether or not I was true to myself and whether or not I made a mistake yeah. in that moment. And and if I did make a mistake, then the reason is, like, there might be something in me that's getting, like, even though I am a guy that, that I, I don't have a desire to run outside capital, I do want to win, right? Yeah. And, like, there is there is a potential that I made a slip in judgment because I want to win badly and and you know if that it would not be worth the trade of sacrificing integrity um, you probably have a family history of wanting to show your your worthwhileness within your family you know you come from a successful family and i, I mean look i'm hazarding a guess what do i know but i think but i think 
you like all of us you you have reasons for wanting for wanting to be successful and appearing to be successful and that can and 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 that's neither a good thing nor a bad thing it's just being aware enough of your own vulnerabilities that that you're you're true to the better side of your personality if that makes sense yeah that is true and i think the other thing is i currently get paid on my investment portfolio and i pretty much donate this podcast to society so yeah. uh, at, at what point um do i have to flip the way that i'm thinking and, and it's possible that i've hit exit velocity and that i do need to rethink that equation um it's also possible i haven't which is I've just been sitting with it a lot, and I I anticipate yeah. sitting with it for a lot longer until I know my answer, right? Um, so if, if I'm honest about it, Bill, what what I I'm 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 always kind of sheepish about admitting this sort of thing, except privately. But I mean, maybe it'll help you, or maybe it'll help other people. Um, but in the same way as that filter about just saying what's the quality move here, I I again and again, I mean, part of my internal monologue multiple times a a day or week without wanting to sound self-righteous about it is basically to be saying, let me be a force for good. Yeah. You know, like it, it's not about being pious or sanctimonious or holier than that. Cause I do lots of stupid things or, you know, I mean, you should see me getting bad tempered about, you know, whatever it is, my son's left this in the sink or whatever, you know, I don't know, like ridiculous stuff. So I'm, I'm not making out that I'm like th this, this righteous individual, but, that's one of my true noughts is just to keep coming back to that sense of let me be a force for good. Let me be some, there's a beautiful line that a, a, um, a, a, a great Kabbalist said where he, he said, you're asking constantly to be a conduit and a resting place for the light. And it's really easy to sound sanctimonious about this when you say it. But I actually think that's a really profound and beautiful idea that you want to be a, a conduit and a resting place for the light. And however you view that, whether you think there's light, whether you think there's God, whether you think it's Mother Nature, whether you, I think there's there's some sort of benevolent force in the universe, whether it's... And, and so, I mean, another thing I think about a lot that, again, without wanting to sound pious, I, it's like, how, how do you give strength to love and mercy and kindness and compassion? Because we also, we have this other side of us, right, which is anger and all of those things. And and. And I think what you're trying to do is constantly tilt the balance with your with your words and your thoughts and your actions towards love, mercy, kindness, compassion, truth, um, treating people with with um, uh, dignity, even whether, you know, human dignity, whether you disagree with them or not, or whether they irritate the hell out of you or not. And. Um, and probably treating the side of ourselves that we dislike with, with, with dignity and compassion as well, which I find really hard. Um, so, so I actually think those filters and those, those kind of true norths that you can come back to, where you just say, well, let me be kinder. Well, let me just be a... F I, I talk about this in the chapter about Manish Pabrai, where he, he read Power Versus Force, which I think is a very important book. Um, and came out of it thinking, well, there are certain characteristics that uh, calibrate at a much higher level, and one of them is truthfulness. And so let me just never lie. Let me just be totally truthful. And I say that I think there's tremendous power in picking a virtue like truthfulness and just saying, yeah, that's going to be a guiding, a guiding light for me. But we don't have to pick the same virtue. And so you can, I, I would say there's a very strong argument for making the guiding, the, the guiding virtue kindness. And, um, and there's no reason why it has to be only one virtue. I mean, we, can, we can pick multiple virtues. Um, but I, I, think these, I think these filters, these very simple filters, get you through a lot of problems. And, and, and one of the points that I try to make repeatedly throughout my book is, when when Munger says take a simple idea and take it seriously, this is one of the great failings I think of a lot of us as investors, but also in other areas of life, is that when we come across a simple idea like this of of um, of say quality as a filter, just saying I, I'm just always going to go for the quality the quality option, whether it's how how to how you work, how you treat people, uh, how you do your podcast, how you invest. Um, or truthfulness, um, th this idea that Monish gets from power versus force. 
the, the key is when you find something that really resonates for you, you really go big on it. And, and, and Monish says in, in that first chapter that most people, when they find a really good idea, they, um, they dabble in it. And he said, they say, yeah, yeah, that's a good idea, whatever. And then they move on. And he said, they just don't understand. And he said, when, when you find one of these ideas, you go a thousand percent on it. And, and what's really interesting to me is that he, he basically took about three ideas, right? Long-term compounding, the power of long-term compounding and not, and not messing it up, um, not getting in the way of it, the power of truthfulness, um, and the power of cloning, of basically saying, what have the people who what what have people who are better and smarter and wiser than me figured out already, so that I can replicate the best of of what they're doing in a way that's true to who I am and to my talents, and those three ideas, then there are probably more of them, but I think those are the three most important ones in a sense when I look at Monish. You combine them, and then you do it over time, and you do it a thousand percent. And the, it's, it's a Lollapalooza effect, to use Munger's term, because they, they compound and they reinforce each other. And so I think one of the things that I'm trying to do in my book is actually to synthesize these ideas for myself and to reduce it, because I have a kind of messy mind where it's going all over the place, as you can see from our conversation. And so I'm trying to take this mass of information and insights and interviews and reduce it to the essence of what's important partly for myself to guide me through life and partly because I want to share it with other people because I think it'll really help them. And as I try to share it with other people, it synthesizes and distills it for me to the essence. And so what, what, what may have sounded in our conversation, like we were focusing too much on your issue is actually it's, it's no, this is essential. It's, it's this, these are, these are filters where we're applying the insights of the great investors to guide us through, everything that we're trying to figure out how how to write a book how to pick your next project how to do your podcast how to invest how to treat your shareholders how to treat your family and these these simple guiding principles that have served people like charlie munger or or, or buffett or howard marks or monish who i interview all of these people who are key characters in the book i i i think they're enormously powerful both in investing and life I agree. Um, I, I think just like to wrap up a little bit of what I'm going through and it, it relates to what you're saying about Monish is one of the things that's a little bit difficult about having a podcast is when I mess up, it's going to be public. Huh. And when um, I was reading your chapter on Monish, I, I, uh, I feel bad saying this out loud, but it's the truth. So fuck it. Um, I, you know, I have had some issues with some of how he's pitched his morphing as an investor. And um, I, you know, I guess that for me, I've projected things onto him that are unfair, mm -hmm. right? And when I read how much he was doing for those people in India, I was like, what a schmuck I've been to have judgment on this guy that's doing so much good in the world. Like, you know, who cares if I invest differently than him or if I have a different philosophy? And, you know, like he is really public with how he teaches. And, you know, for me to have an uninformed opinion on him is really unfair. And I'm sure people will have it of me, too. And it's uh, reading that chapter for me. I don't know. I was laying in bed and I was just like, I'm such a schmuck. You know, because I, mm -hmm. I don't see what he's actually doing behind bars or behind bars, <laughs> behind, behind bars. the scenes. You know, I'm sorry. <laughs> like, I might, that one I might have to cut out. I don't know why uh, that slipped. That's very but, funny. Um, no, but like I just, you know, you don't know who these people are behind the scenes. And um, it's funny because you talk about commitment bias and stuff like that in the book. Uh, and I... I would say that the hardest thing for me about being public is going to be, uh, assuming that I continue being public, just being okay with people misunderstanding what's really going on, you know, and, I, and I've had a peek behind the lens of a couple issues in, over the past, you know, 18 months where, or 12 months or whatever, that have been pretty high profile that you know, sort of the understanding is not exactly what's reality and, 
you know, it's not that uh, that's the stuff that keeps me up at night or doesn't keep me up, but that like I worry about. It's not so much um, the the commitment and consistency bias, but I really did. I, I like that chapter a lot because I thought it showed a side of him and what he's doing that um, at least in my mind was underappreciated. We're also, we're complex characters and there are aspects of our, I, I often feel this when I, when I hold a door open for someone and I haven't got to do this for months because I've been holed up at home during COVID, but, but I'll, I'll hold a door open for someone and, you know, I'm this English gentleman with a great sense of manners and then they don't say anything and I immediately feel the rage building up in myself. Yeah, and how I realize, dare you? Yeah, exactly. And, you know, uh, and so you realize that you, that you have both sides of you in this and, uh, it, but both aspects of, um, uh, 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 in each of us and, and in situations where we're particularly stressed, um, it doesn't bring out the best in us. And I think one of the things that had a big practical impact on me in this book that I've really tried to harness in my own life is the stuff that I write about with Ken Schubenstein, who's a friend of mine, who's a, a, a neurologist, uh, but was a hedge fund manager. And, and in this chapter that I write about, about Charlie Munger and about not being foolish, about how to avoid standard stupidities, Munger is not a very emotional man, so it's not difficult for him to counter his emotions. He's not really feeling those emotions. But for most of us, we're really vulnerable to our emotions. And, and one of the things that, that Ken Schubenstein, having studied a lot of the medical and scientific literature about the brain, understands is how to tilt the odds in your favor so that in very stressful, difficult situations, you're more likely to behave well and think clearly. And one of the things that, that he talks about is that there are basically four things that, that we know have a really powerful cognitive impact and, and they're sleep, good nutrition, exercise and meditation. And so if you focus, especially during these very intense periods, but also before these very intense periods, because as he points out, you, you need to develop these good habits, not when you're in the storm, but actually before you're in the storm. It's, it's, very, it's very powerful because you're just tilting, tilting the odds in your favor that you won't become so flooded that you make stupid decisions. And, and whether it's because the market's imploding or your marriage is in trouble or your kids are playing up or whatever it is. And another thing that, that, that Ken does that I think is very powerful is when, when there's too much complexity, when there's too much going on and he feels himself under stress, he goes through his can calendar, just tries to cancel as much as possible. So he's really practically reducing complexity. And then a third tool that I think is enormously important that I think about the whole time is he developed this mnemonic, which I think he got initially from a lot of the addiction literature that he'd studied, scientific literature on addiction and what, what makes people revert um, uh, to their addiction, for example, and, and, and what, conditions are, what, what conditions emotionally are preconditions for cognitive screw-ups, basically. And what he does is he has this, this mnemonic, which is HALT PS, which is when he knows that he's hungry or angry or lonely or tired or in pain or sad or scared, he knows that those are preconditions for messing up. And one of the things that was fascinating to me was when I interviewed him a few months ago, he, he had, he'd actually, he'd, he'd quit the investment business a couple of years ago and went back to being a doctor and did his residency in neurology. It's an amazing thing for a guy in his late forties to, to, to go from having 300 people at his company, um, being very wealthy and successful to going back to be at the bottom of the, the medical field. Um, he's a remarkable guy. I, I, I'm, I'm so, as I've said to him before, I'm kind of proud of him for doing it. It's an amazing thing. And one of the things in the last year is he's been treating COVID patients on ventilators. Mm. And, and he said again and again that he was applying that whole PS technique in the emergency room. So this technique that really helped him as an investor was also helping him to deal with, for example, the families of COVID patients when he had to call them and tell them 
that their relative was dying. You know, he he had to he had to be aware, for example, that the PPE equipment that he was wearing was physically painful, and to wear that all day, this these tight goggles and masks and all of these things, he was just in pain, and he was tired, and he was sad, and he was angry about how how little equipment there was and how badly the country had dealt with this this crisis, and. So he needed to be aware that he needed to take a little bit more time because he was more likely to screw up and he was less likely to be compassionate towards the family or towards the patient. And so I think there are these subtle, these subtle techniques that if you, if you really harness them are very, very powerful in terms of just making it more likely that you make a good decision, whether it's in markets or, or in life. Hmm. That's cool. I, I really like how you uh, summarize the the learnings that you had at the end of each chapter. I, I like how the book you synthesize and and try to like wrap up, um, you know the like I said the learnings. Uh, yeah, thanks. Did that was you a have very a conscious... particular learning that like has changed you more than others? Um, there there are a lot of them. Um, I'm trying to think what had the most impact on me. I think there's a reason why I end the book with Arnold Vandenberg. And He's the man. I love that yeah. guy. I, I heard him, I, I was fortunate to meet him once and I heard him speak once. He is just an incredible, incredible human. He's a wonderful human being. And, and, and I write about him at the end because I'm saying, here I am, I've interviewed over 25 years, all of these legendary investors. I've interviewed so many billionaires and they've hit the jackpot in this financial sense. But what actually constitutes a successful and truly abundant life? And there's a wonderful line that I use as the, the headline for that section of that, that epilogue of the book where um, he said to me, I'm the richest man in the world. And that's not because he has as much money as Buffett or Bill Ackman or Carl Icahn or whatever, but he's an extraordinary role model. Um, and when I think about when I think about can why we frame he's, who he is just in case people yeah, don't don't know because his yeah. story is incredible. Yeah, Arnold's a fascinating guy, and one one of the reasons I write about him at great length is because. As I say, he was he was dealt the worst hand of all of these investors. So most of these great investors, they came from backgrounds where they went to Wharton or Harvard Business School or Columbia Business School. They they got great educations. They were clearly really smart, and then they made it on Wall Street. And Arnold was born in 1939 in Amsterdam. Right off, I, I guess very soon, very soon afterwards, the Nazis invaded, and and most of the the Jews in the Netherlands were killed. And Arnold's from this Jewish family, on the same street as Anne Frank, and so he spent the first couple of years of his life in hiding behind behind a a fake wall in a Christian family's house, where they they risked their life to um, to to hide Arnold and his brother Sigmund and his parents. And then his parents decided, well, if the Nazis come in and search the house and Arnold screams or cries, they'll they'll basically send us all to Auschwitz and, and the women and kids were the first to die there. So Arnold was sent to a farm in the in the in the countryside where he was uh, actually to an orphanage. His brother was sent to a farm and Arnold was hidden uh, at this Christian orphanage and the girl who took him there, who, who took him out of the house and across the country and hid him there, was probably 17 years old at the time. And um, she didn't know him. She didn't know the family. She was Christian, not Jewish, um, and put her life at risk to save his life. And I, I consciously, I, I name her in the book and I name the family that hid, that hid them because I, I, I want to do them honor. And um, and many years later, when he went to a psychiatrist after his first marriage had fallen apart and his wife had left him for another man, he said to his psychiatrist, he always would talk about him, Doc, Dr. Ramaljack. He's talked to, to, about Dr. Ramaljack many times, um, who I don't name in the book. He said, he said, he just, it had tormented him for years. Why had this girl risked her life to save the life of a stranger? 
because she would have been killed and her whole family would have been killed if she'd been caught. And he said that the shrink said, well, it's, it's simple, it's obvious. And he's like, yeah, what, what's simple about it? And Dr. Ramaljack said, for some people, their life is more important than their principles. And for other people, their principles are more important than their life. And this had a huge impact on Arnold because he decided, well, I need to live my life in a way that's driven by principle, partly to honor the people who'd saved his life. And partly, I think it just resonated for him as a, as a way to live. And he, he was very full of anger and hatred after he came out of the Holocaust. I mean, I think 39 members of his family had been killed by the Nazis. Um, and so he was, he had a lot of rage. And then his, his parents actually had been thrown into Auschwitz um, because they'd been, they'd basically been snitched on by a, by a storekeeper who knew that they were Jewish and told the Nazis. And his parents actually survived Auschwitz and they were extraordinary characters, but life is not simple as, as Jean-Marie Eviard said to me. And you would think, oh, well, they were these poor downtrodden, downtrodden heroes and victims and we should just feel empathy for them and we should. But his father came out and his father was a really tough guy and his father used to hit Arnold. And so Arnold and, and, and Arnold said he finally stopped hitting him when, when he hit his dad back and, and his dad, I, I don't write about this in the book, he said his dad was just slumped on a chair in the living room, just crying and was like, I cannot believe that my own son would hit me. And mm. so, so Arnold came out really it's tormented. It's so interesting that that's the response to getting hit back. Yeah. And Arnold was like, yeah, you better believe it. And if you hit <laughs> yeah, me again, I'm right. going to hit you again. And next time I'm going to hit you first before you yeah. get me. And so his father never hit him again. And, and so Arnold came, came out of the Holocaust as this kind of emaciated kid who could barely walk. By the time he was six, he, he could basically only shuffle along on his knees because he'd been so malnourished. And he once heard a psychiatrist talk to his mom because his mom was really concerned that, as he put it, uh, there were signs that I was not too bright. And his, his, he overheard the psychiatrist say, well, maybe he's got brain damage because he was malnourished at this really important stage of his life. So Arnold comes out with this sense that he's kind of stupid, that um, he's full of rage. His wife leaves him for someone else. Um, and yet somehow manages to gain control over his mind, over his inner landscape and transform himself from a rage filled, angry victim into this incredibly loving, decent, kind, compassionate bloke. And there's something so heroic about that. Um, and I think very powerful for all of us as a, as a model of how to, how to gain control over, over your thoughts and your emotions, but also what constitutes a happy and abundant life. Because what I see with Arnold is he's, he's so, he, he gets so much joy out of helping other people. And I see the quality of his relationships and I, I see him trying to help me. I mean, I, I, I mentioned in the, in the notes on additional sources and resources of the book, how many, how many books we've sent to each other. And he sent me a trampoline at some point because he was just worried that I was like too slothful and wasn't exercising enough. And then he would send me articles about about how NASA had found that trampolining was the single best exercise. And then he would send me information on dieting. I, I got a book the other day and I can't remember whether he whether I had bought it because of him or whether he had sent it to me. I just don't know because we send each other lots of books. And so I can see here's someone who just is living his life in a way where um, he's just sharing all the time. And, and, as, and, and he said to me last week, we were talking on the phone and he said, um, and he, he said, I just thank God every day for the money because it just, it's just the most amazing thing that I can help other people. Um, and it doesn't hurt me. I, I don't, you know, it's not like I eat any less well because he eats like a sparrow anyway. He, he basically has like beetroot smoothies and celery smoothies. When, when, I, when, I, was, when I, I went and spent like two and a half days with him in Texas for this book. And I, you know, I'm like this fat lard ass trying try desperately to, to eat all day and I'm always wondering when my next meal is coming. And he's sitting there. He's like, yeah, I haven't eaten in 18 hours or something. And, and then finally his, uh, his assistant brings this awful looking smoothie out and he's like in heaven because it's got some celery in it. Um, and, and he was trying to get back to, you know, my fighting weight of 155 or whatever, because he was like 158 or something. And so, 
I, I mean, it's not like it, it, spending money on other people is affecting his diet because, um, you know, but but he said to me even the other day, he said, he said, you know how you can tell what people are like? He said, you see how they treat a waiter. You yeah. see how they treat the people who they can get nothing out of. He's like, that's a really interesting clue to what somebody is like. And you see with Arnold, I'll, I'll be emailing with someone and they'll send me they'll send me an email about something that Arnold has done for them. And you realize it's a total stranger who's reached out to Arnold and he sent them some book that could help them or some idea that could help them. And it reminds me a little bit of my late grandfather, Henry, who my son is named after, who you just felt left this trail of kindness wherever he went. And, and so in many ways, Arnold is such a beautiful embodiment of what a successful life means. And so he's, he, he's had this very happy marriage to this lovely, lovely woman. And he's very charitable, very decent. He's got control over his thoughts. He has a sense of mission. I mean, I write about how, how these, these people came and wanted to buy his company for what would probably have been more than $100 million. And here's a guy who'd come from absolutely nothing. I mean, just nothing. And I mean, he, when he was at high school, he had a job working in a factory like four hours a day. I mean, he, he just had nothing from, from the age of 13, his father made him support himself by his own clothes, by, by everything. Mm -hmm. And, um, and yet when he was offered, um, the opportunity to sell his firm and cash out, he's like, I would rather close it down than sell it to people who I thought might not take care of my clients. And so. A, a deeply honorable, deeply ethical, deeply loving, deeply kind person. And then you see the impact of, of him on all these people around him. And you just think, well, uh, that's, that's a real model. That's someone I'd like to be more like. If I, can, if I can tilt the balance to become more like that, and then at the same time get control of whatever, whatever, whatever negative feelings, whatever, um, uh, patterns I have. Um, that's a pretty amazingly successful lifetime. And I, so, and I think what's kind of lovely in writing about him is I see his happiness. So there's this great paradox that in becoming kinder and more sharing and more loving, he's become totally joyful. And so I don't, I don't dismiss the importance of making money. I mean, this is a book that does promise to make you richer. And I do think that the principles we study from people like Munger and, and Monish and, and Tom Gaynor and Howard Marks, Joe Greenblatt, all of these great investors, they, they will make you money and they'll prevent you doing stupid things like I've done in the past, where, where I invested in things I didn't really understand for ego driven reasons. And, and uh, I mean, they help you prevent a lot of stupidity, these principles. But I don't think you should lose sight of these deeper ideas about what actually constitutes a successful life. And, and so much of that comes down to these questions like resilience, how, how you become more resilient, how you gain equanimity, um, what you focus on, whether, whether you should become focused on getting bigger houses and bigger cars and the like, or, or something else. And here's Arnold who bought a house in Texas for $350,000 many years ago. And he said, we would never sell it. We love this house. And, and when one of his kids said to him, why don't you get a Mercedes? He said, oh, I would hate to have a Mercedes. I, would, I, I don't want to identify myself with people who think that way. And then finally, his, he, he had this crappy car that was like 10, 12 years old. And his wife, and it was just great value. I think it was something like a Mazda or something like that. He was just like, it was the best value for money you could possibly get. And his, this is when he was already a very successful money manager. And, and his wife, Eileen, said to him, um, uh, she, she wanted to get him a Lexus, I think. And it made him really uncomfortable. He was really uncomfortable driving it at first. But he said um, he saw how much joy it gave her to give huh. him the car. And so he huh. got it. And so there are deep principles for how to behave and how to live that Arnold just embodies. And there's something lovely about the fact that at some level, he's quite, he's, he's simpler in the way that he speaks about these things than some of the most brilliant minds in the book. But I feel like there are certain things that he says in the book where I'm like, that's deep wisdom. 
there's there's yeah. there's a really there's there's a sense that he's a profoundly wise human being and and so he he for me he, there there are aspects of everyone in this book that I want to emulate and that I uh, that, that are eminently clonable but when I look at Arnold I'm like that's that's someone I, I really want to be like and he said to me a week or so ago I I, I don't understand why you present me as as a as the person you regard as the best role model in the in the book of all of the great investors you've met and even the way that he said that there's a deep humility to the fact that he couldn't couldn't believe that he would be held up as that and when i explained it to him that it was partly because of his control over his mind and his thoughts and his emotions and partly because he just takes gets so much joy out of sharing with other people he, he he told me this wonderful story about how a friend of his from high school, I mean, he's now 81, and he's still best friends with his friends from high school, these three friends of his from high school. And he's like, yeah, my friend was just saying how you, you were always just really genuine, even at high school. And he told me this wonderful story about helping to repair this friend's car when it got smashed up um, when he was, a, I guess, a teenager. And, and he said, I got so much joy out of repairing his car with him. And they literally, they had to go to the scrap yard to get like a new fender and stuff. I mean, they had nothing. And they spray painted the car and fixed it. And he said, you know what? I still have the photograph of that car and my friend next to it um, beaming after we fix it. I still have that photograph in my, in my office. And so think of that. He's kept that photograph for probably 60 years because it gives him such joy. And that's a really beautiful human being a really wonderful trait and i i don't know it's something it's something to aspire to to get that kind of sympathetic joy out of some people out of other people's happiness that that's an amazing gift to have that in life well and especially to come from where he came from and to to not uh turn into a bitter human being mm. but to be even like a larger giver uh, I mean, I don't know what he would have been in an, in an alternative reality, right? But I remember when we saw each other in New York at the MOI Global event. And, you know, here's a, a room of people that I respect from an investment perspective. And I saw a table sitting around somebody and I went to sit down and I thought, you know, oh, I'm going to hear some investment mm. stuff. And it was Arnold talking about life. And I was just completely enamored. And I yeah. mean, like, there there are some people that, I, I don't know, it's just, I, I don't know how to describe it except for to say that there are some people who you can just tell have, like, truly good souls. Yeah. And, like, yeah. he he was one of those guys that I just couldn't stop listening to and admiring. He's just an incredible human. Yeah, and and if if you believe what David Hawkins writes in books like Power Versus Force, um, which which I'm inclined to believe. I take David Hawkins very seriously. I read probably most of his books, and and uh, they've had a big impact on me. There's a there's a sense that you. I mean, he, he'll use the word calibrate. Arnold will use the word vibrate. That you vibrate at a different level as you become more loving, kinder, more compassionate, more truthful, more honest, more decent, more caring, and that characteristics. Um, like anger and jealousy uh, just vibrate or calibrate at a much lower level. And, and so Hawkins terminology is that certain characteristics make or certain types of behavior make you go weak and they make the other person go weak. And other types of behavior like truthfulness or kindness make you go strong and that people sense it. And whether and, and he, he did all of this kinesiology stuff where he would measure you know the impact on your muscles of certain types of behavior i don't know how replicable that is i don't know if other people could do it i i don't know that it matters i think you find in when you look at someone like arnold he embodies these characteristics and it makes you go strong and i i i have this thing i mean it's literally it's on my it's on my wall here if i can look at it it's a quote that i got from um from power versus force when I glanced into it a few weeks ago. And he said, wisdom can ultimately be reduced to the simple process of avoiding that which makes you go weak. Nothing else is really required. So even, so that's on a post-it near my mm. desk. I have lots of post-its like this where just, you know, they suddenly catch my eye and I'm like, oh, that's interesting. And so if you think about the things that make you go weak, curiously, 
those include things like um, guilt, which I often, as somebody mm. who sort of looks at my characteristics and thinks, Ooh, I don't much like that, I need to change that. I, I'm inclined towards guilt and self-flagellation and remorse and stuff. And I like that too. I like to beat myself up. It's one of yeah. my favorite pastimes. Yeah. And, and what Hawkins says is that actually things like guilt and shame calibrate unbelievably low, way below huh. the level of like 200, which is kind of his, his fulcrum where things turn positive. And so huh. what you're trying to do, whether this is metaphorical shame is or- Shame some toxic stuff. That's some hard shame stuff is to get toxic. over. And, yeah. and when you've done something that you're ashamed of, figuring out how to take responsibility for it and when to let go of it, um, it's a very power, uh, it's, a, it's a very difficult thing. And so part of Can what I just I've, real quick, I, I, yeah. I don't mean to cut you off, but the thing about shame that I think is so uh, insidious is it's hard to even acknowledge, right? And like yeah. uh, by, by almost by definition, how it manifests itself in me, um, like it's almost hard to even talk to myself about. Yeah. And because of that, it eats even deeper. Well, it's one of your, it's one of your beautiful monsters that you want to work on and yeah. that you want to befriend. And, and so I think one of the reasons why I became close to Ken Schubenstein, who I was mentioning before, the, the hedge fund manager turned neurologist, is that he had a terrible time during the financial crisis and, and more or less lost control of his fund, not really through any fault of his own, just because people, he didn't have a gate and people bailed out at the worst possible time. And he felt a deep sense of shame because he's a very candid, very honest person. We talked about it. And I had the same thing because I lost my job during the financial crisis where I'd been editing the European, Middle East and African edition of Time. And I, and I got canned because they were moving all of the jobs back to New York. And, but not all, like, which made it even worse because there were some people who survived, but I was really expensive yeah, and I didn't survive. you were the one that didn't make the cut, right? Yeah, yeah I, that would be hard. And, and I'd had this very prominent job where I would get to interview presidents and prime ministers and the like, and I felt like kind of a big shot. And then suddenly I felt like this deep sense of shame and like embarrassment and fear over the future. Like what if, you know, my industry is collapsing. I was living in London in a house that was paid for by time. Um, my kids were at private school paid for by time. And suddenly I'm like, where do I live? What do I do? What profession do I do? What if I can't take care of my kids? What, I mean, it was a, this is one of the reasons why I don't dismiss the idea that money is important because the fact that I had no debt and the fact that I had saved money and the fact that I didn't have to sell any of my investments, that, that I kind of knew that, I mean, I'd survived something like five rounds of layoffs already. So I knew that we were always on thin ice as journalists. So I'd been, I'd been fairly conservative in, in making sure that I would survive whatever came along. But it was still, it was a very painful and kind of shaming situation. Uh, I at least felt it. And, and, and I think Ken went through a similar sense because Ken was someone who never really failed at anything. I mean, he was incredibly smart, um, good athlete, um, a, a, a doctor from a medical family, uh, academic, taught, taught at Columbia Business School, I mean, just a really, really smart, accomplished guy, sort of five degrees or something, very bright. And so for people like us to, who'd been very successful, suddenly to be laid low in a very public way, it's very hard to deal with, which is one of the reasons why I write about resilience so much in this book about how you deal with setbacks and pain. And so I think these issues of, of shame over our own vulnerability or shame over our own failures or shame over our own um, uh, personal flaws or things that we've done wrong or ways that we've mistreated people. It's a very, it's a very important issue that I think it's very uncomfortable for most of us to deal with. But for me, it was quite clarifying um, to read Hawkins and be like, oh, so actually guilt and shame calibrate low. And so what I really want to do is as much as possible flood the zone with things like compassion, kindness, love, mercy, self-compassion, um, not things that come easily to me. And so there's, a, there's another quote that I have on my wall here that's also that's on the other wall that's also from him, from Hawkins, that begins, simple kindness to oneself and all that lives is the most transformational force of all. And it, it goes on, it's an extraordinary quote, but that to me was very hard to take in. I almost missed that, right? The, the, I start to think, okay, so simple kindness is, is to all that lives is the most transformational force of all. And then I'm like, no, no, simple kindness to oneself yeah. and all that lives. That 
that's not something that comes naturally to me. And that's something where I'm trying to rewire myself. And, and when I look at, when I look at someone like Arnold, who was able to take all of the anger, the victimization and rewire himself, that gives me hope. And there's a, there's a, a, a great Kabbalist called Rav Ashlag who said that it's a spiritual law that any negative characteristic you have, you can transform. And I, my default position is to believe that anything Rav Ashlag says was just true, that he was just revealing truth. Like he was a very, very extraordinary Kabbalist. And and mm. I and I somewhat have that feeling when I read Hawkins, or when I read someone like Sokni Rinpoche or his father, Toku Urjian Rinpoche. So I'm not I'm not trying to be like a proselytizer for one particular path. I think one of the things that Arnold taught me is he said he would just go wherever the truth led him, and so he was perfectly happy. That the book that he he sent me or that I bought on his recommendation last week is is um. It seems to be by a by a priest, um, and so I don't think it matters where you're mm. getting this wisdom. You want to go where the truth leads you, and I think in each of these paths there are these very very um, profound. I, I was going to say thinkers, but I don't think it, it it's different. My my book is thought through. I'm groping towards truth, and I'm trying to share things that I think are true that or approximately true that I've learned from people. I think then there are people like Rav Ashlag who are actually revealing truth. And yeah, it's not intellectually. It doesn't need to be argued. Yeah, yeah. No, that makes sense to me. That distinction. Um, I like how how your book is one that can spur these kind of conversations. And then also from an investment perspective, you highlight, um, you know, it, managers that did it through diversification, managers that did it through concentration. And a lot of, uh, a lot of what I took from your book is uh, what we've been talking about through this conversation, it, it, being true to oneself and, and executing a strategy that, ultimately you can realize as the investor as opposed to trying to put somebody you know putting yourself in somebody else's box i mean you know i i come from the church of berkshire hmm. and you know i watched that the buffett clip where he says like i would have 50% in my best idea i mean i i'm not him yeah right and and that doesn't mean just because i admire him that doesn't mean that i have to force myself to do what he says he would do because that would actually violate the fundamental principle that I think he's preaching, which is to be true to oneself. Uh, yeah. That's what I have really yeah. taken from Charlie and, and Warren is like, think for yourself and do what you need to do. And don't well, go like, back, go back look to that in the phrase, mirror and be okay with it. Unobstructed self-expression. So you yeah. have to be true to yourself, but there's a great paradox here because you're cloning people like Buffett and Munger and you're saying, what did they figure out? What, what can I replicate? But then you're saying, how do I clone in a way that's really true to who I am? Yeah. And so I take, so, so you're having actually to take the best models in life um, and, and the best insights and principles, and then know yourself well enough that you can take from this buffet. So, so I think Monish's idea of going out on the truth variable as far as you can, as he puts it, like just being really truthful, I think that's a really powerful idea. Um, but as I say in the book, it may be that it's more powerful to go as far out as you can on the kindness variable. Like, but I don't know that I'm right, but I think probably, I don't know, is it, I, I was going to say, I think it's probably tougher for me to go to, uh, I, I don't know. They're, they're both a challenge to be truthful and to be kind. I mean, especially when we're in a bad state, it's, it's hard, but just what's your what's your priority and to um and so i think i think you take these principles and th this th i mean this is one of the reasons why tom gainer doesn't like the word cloning because he said it it suggests that you're just mimicking not thinking yes not thinking and he said yes. what he was doing and it's interesting because i actually think tom is an incredible cloner and in some ways markel is a clone of berkshire but what tom pointed out to me which is an important nuance is, is that he was recombining what Buffett had figured out and applying it to his own circumstances and his own temperament. And so 
I think as with most of these truths, the, the truth is kind of simple, but then it's also paradoxical, like that the opposite is also true. So yeah, clone like crazy, but also clone in a way that's true to who you are. And, and this, one of the things that I wrestled with in this book is that when you synthesize these things and you distill them down to their essence, they can sound really simplistic and quite banal. And it's quite easy to, I mean, what, what does living, living with a sense of quality really mean? Or what does trying to be more truthful mean? Or what does trying to be kinder really mean? Or to share that, that it's very much like Munger's description of investing where he says simple, not easy. And so the concepts themselves are absolutely simple, um, but living by them is very hard. And, and I, I, and I write about this a lot in the chapter on Joel Greenblatt, where he's a master of simplicity. And he, he says, really, after all these years of teaching and investing and writing best-selling books about investing and, and managing money brilliantly, what he figured out is it all comes down to one thing, which is basically value an, as, value an asset and buy it for much less than it's worth. And that's it. But then, but then all of the applications of that and all of the different ways to do that and the challenge of doing it despite our own behavioral glitches and the pressures of the market and our, our fear of missing out and uh, uh, our, our intellectual blind spots, all of these things and the difficulty of valuing things and the difficulty of predicting the future and um, predicting what cash flows will be down the road, all of these things make it incredibly difficult. But the, but the insights and the principles themselves underlying these things are are surprisingly simple, I think. And and one of the things that David Hawkins says is that truth is simple. And I think if you really understand something as simple as the idea of Rav Ashtag's, that you're trying to transform the desire to receive for the self alone into the desire to receive for the sake of sharing, it's a very, very simple idea, but it requires you to spend your life transforming, you know, me, 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 the, the ego into something more sharing, which is what someone like Arnold Vandenberg, I think, has done. Um, because even those negative characteristics, like like fear and anger and, and a sense of victimization, those are all about me. Um, it's like, well, this person makes me feel this way. And so part of letting go of that anger, um, the rage that he felt towards his parents, towards the Nazis, actually, that's a letting go of ego. And, and one of the things that he did is he just said to himself over and over again, um, I'm a loving person. And so he really believed in the power of affirmations. He hypnotized himself. And then he, he also told me this really wonderful story that that transformed him that I tell in, in the book, where when he was about 16 and he had no money at all, and he was, you know, he was working incredibly hard to save up for a car so that he could take girls out on dates. And so he was selling flowers on the street corner and he he was such a good salesman and he's a very charming guy and he was huh. such a good salesman that he finally i could see that he is uh, he he does have a a way with the yeah. ability to communicate right yeah what the english would call the gift of the gab and yeah and indeed. so so he um he he's given the i bet best. he was a dapper dude back in the day he was handsome i think yeah yeah i he bet was he was and i bet he was smooth yeah yeah. All right. I, yeah. I digress. So, so he so he was given the best street corner to sell on. I guess this must be in Los Angeles. And on the day that he goes to sell these flowers, um, there's like this biblical storm and, and it's just a deluge and he's just totally soaked. And this woman is driving past and he, he refuses to stop selling. And he's just can't believe his bad luck you know, who wants to buy flowers on a day like that? And he's standing there by the side of the road selling his flowers. And this stranger stops in her car and says to him, you need to get out of the rain. And he's like, no, 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 I'm just going to keep selling. It's fine. And she says, how much are these flowers? How much are they? And he tells her, and she says, how much for all of the flowers? And so she buys all of the flowers and says, so that he'll come out of the rain and says to him, get in my car, I'm going to take you and get you a dry clothes and she drives him to her home and she takes a, a dry sweater or shirt of her husband's and she makes him hot soup. And he, he said, basically, I, I, tell it, I tell this story in the book, but I don't tell it as fully. He, he, said, he said that when somebody touches your heart like that, it changes your whole life. 
Um, and he's never forgotten that woman. But what I what I don't say in the book because maybe I mean I worried maybe that it would get in the way, of, but also that I was doing it too slowly. Um, he said she was not Jewish, and he said it was the first time he saw someone not Jewish do something so kind to him. And so here he was, this sixteen year old kid who'd come out of the Holocaust, full of this sense of rage and betrayal and victimization, totally naturally and understandably. My my family comes from the same background, and he sees this act of kindness for no reason, just total kindness for no reason. And and he said that totally changed his life. And there was a story that he's totally forgotten that I reminded him of recently, where one of the times that I interviewed him, he told me I, I, I was just in a line in, I think it was a phone store. And there's this girl and she's talking about how she's about to leave Texas for the first time ever, because I think it was her brother-in-law or cousin or her brother or something was graduating as a Marine and she was going to celebrate. And he took out a hundred dollar bill and said, I want to give you this so you can take him out for a meal and celebrate. And she's like, I can't take this from you. You're a total stranger. Like, what, how would I? And he's like, no, no, no. It's a real gift for me to be able to give it to you. And she she took it. And um, And sometimes when he would do something like that, he would tell the person about the woman who bought the flowers. Mm. And so here he is. 65 years later, transformed by an act of kindness by that woman. And so if you think about what we were saying before about um, I am ashes and dust or no, the whole world was created just for me, that woman's one act of kindness transformed the life of this extraordinary guy. That's an incredible story. And you know what's extraordinary? He went to give her a box of chocolates later in the week and he took multiple buses to get there. And she was in her garden. She was talking over the fence to her neighbor. And it was a really big deal for him to go give her the box of chocks. And she was like, yeah, yeah, thank you. And didn't want to talk to him. And <laughs> this is another of those things, like the complexity of life, like the person you yeah. want to lionize as having saved his life. And he's like, she just wasn't interested. You know, she was just a really nice person. And on, on the day, she brought all my flowers and took me out of the rain. And huh. the, it, it, it complicates the story and in a way makes it more beautiful because... She wasn't even aware of what she did to to transform the life of this extraordinary young guy. And and likewise, that 17 year old girl who saved his life by taking him out of hiding to an orphanage, um, you know, she totally changed this guy's life. And actually decades later, Arnold and that girl talked to each other. She She survived and he survived. And I don't think either of them knew that the other survived and they ended up having a phone call. Um, probably 10, 20 years ago, something like that. Not not that long ago. Um, and so on the one hand, we're irrelevant and we're just ashes and dust. And on the other hand, the way we behave, even these little things like buying buying the flowers for the kid who's in the rain getting poured on actually reverberates out over over 65 years. And that's, that's kind of humbling and beautiful. Indeed it is. Um, you know, I, I would... I'd love to keep going, but I think that's a beautiful place to uh, stop this particular conversation. And I hope that you will come back and we can talk a little bit more about your career. Your career was amazing. Huh. I loved talking to you the first time, but uh, we got lost in some important stuff there. So uh, this hopefully you'll be willing to come back on the podcast sometime. Anytime. Where can people find you and where can they get the book? Uh, the book uh, you can get anywhere. It's called Richer, Wiser, Happier. And the subtitle is How the World's Greatest Investors Win in Markets and Life. And it came out on April 20th. So it's very new. And please write to me. Let me know what resonates with you. Because I feel like I'm, I'm, on, I'm on this journey with you. It's not like I'm, I'm, I'm super rich and super wise and super happy. Mo most of the time, I'm pretty happy. Um, but um, uh, thank God. But the... Um, uh, you know, I'm on this journey as well. And so if there's stuff that resonates and that you feel has helped you, or if there are things you feel I should be reading or people I should be interviewing, let me know. Um, I'm on Twitter at William Green 72. You're welcome to um, visit my website, which is williamgreenwrites.com. Uh, you're welcome to connect with me on LinkedIn. Um, if you message me on LinkedIn or Twitter, I, I tend to reply. Sometimes I get a little overwhelmed with all of the complexity of it all. But um uh, I'm, yeah, he's I'm, not an emailer. Uh, well, as of this <laughs> morning, I've, the been, current technical I, I've, problems. Been, <laughs> I've been kicked off email because of some technological glitch or failure of mine. Um, but um, 
yeah, keep in touch. I mean, I, I, I feel like we're, we're all on this journey together. And if we can, if we can help each other in different ways to figure things out and to, to find our way through the, through the fog, um, it's very helpful. And it's one of the things that I've really loved about this book process is that I found, I think, this tribe of people who, who are grappling with the same issues as I am. And I, I think one of the things that really strikes me it, is I think most of us are trying to find a slightly more enlightened way to do capitalism. We're not just trying to line our pockets and behave in the most self-seeking way. And I, I, one of the things I'm trying to do in the book is to highlight that there's a, there's a different way. And, it's, I, I, and I think Munger in his own way embodies it, Buffett embodies it, Nick Sleep, um, Tom Gaynor, Arnold Vandenberg. And, and I, I hope that people look at these people and think, ah, yeah, it's, it's, it's not just that they won the game, it's the manner in which they won the game. And, and that's, that's hugely heartening to think that there are, there's, a, there's a different way of winning the game where it's not a zero sum game, you, you win and you help others. And um, I think that's, that's part of what maybe touched you in the chapter about Monich is that he took his weird ability to sit alone in a room quietly gathering information and waiting for a mispriced bet and then took it to transform other people's lives. And that's a, that's a, that's a wonderful model to take, to take your, your talents, um, your very unique talents and use them in a way that, that helps other people while also giving you a joyful life. Yeah, no doubt. I've, I've found the more that I give back, the more happy I am. So, uh, yeah, it's this wonderful paradox, right? Indeed, indeed. So thank you very much for joining me. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, William Green, now you know why uh, I enjoyed talking to him for so long the first time we met. And I enjoyed and, it. And again, why you and almost I missed your flight. <laughs> yeah, that's true. All right. Well, take care and thank you very much. Good luck with the book release. Lovely to see you. Thank you. Bye.